Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark tells us the Canadian dollar is undervalued. Casey Research's Doug Casey talks about how a President Trump would be good for junior mining companies. John Kaiser reports on what was hot at the Toronto Mines and Money Show. And Peyton Nyquist wraps up the Canadian junior markets. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have Company Showcase with Lee Barker, the Chief Technical Advisor for GEM International. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. GEM International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. GEM International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. We're chatting with Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Nice to be here, Jim. Taking a look at the Canadian equity markets over the last few months, have they been doing better than the U.S.? Oh, yes. I mean, in particular, the, uh, the you know, that first, that the first half of the year, without a doubt, uh, the uh, Canadian market was doing better, and as we move through the summer, it managed to hold up its, uh, itself very, very well. And um, here we are, the end of the calendar quarter, and you're looking at uh, the Canadian market pretty much testing the, the best levels of the year. And um, this, uh, you know, you put that in contrast to uh, the U.S. market, uh, which had a pretty uh, choppy summer period, and not up there. And you look at Europe, the uh, it's been a lot of pressure over there. So clearly, even though we are, what, 2% or less of the uh, the world's economic uh, power out there and uh, GDP, we are uh, definitely one of the better places to be. And in particular, you know, we, we talked about this last year, when you have two to three years where the U.S. market has outperformed the Canadian, it's only natural that this would be the reversal year. Deutsche Bank. What a difference a few days makes. A few days ago, they were saying the bank was in such bad shape, they might have to be bailed out by the government. Now, Deutsche Bank has put out a statement saying their balance sheets have never looked better in the last 20 years. What yeah, is going you know, they, on? Yeah, they've gone from the Department of Justice um, wanting $14 billion in settlement to the point where uh, it looks as though they could be doing something just a shade under $5 billion. Still a monstrous number, and uh, clearly... As far as the German government is concerned, uh, they want to see this settled and uh, with a you know a reasonably small number, which is what we've got here. And when you look at uh, what uh, Deutsche Bank made over the years, this really is just still just a, a slap on the wrist. Uh, you know, the market got spooked on Thursday uh, when uh, there was the talk of hedge funds pulling their cash from Deutsche Bank. Not all of the cash, but a lot of uh, the spare cash that was sitting there. And then we walked in on Friday, and uh, it was clearly a change in the relationship. Uh, here we are now talking about uh, the uh, settlement. So for all that uh, we're thrashing around, uh, 200 points down on the Dow one day and up 200 the next. So you're finishing off the month uh, pretty much unchanged as far as the U.S. equity markets are concerned. OPEC said it's going to talk in November about possibly cutting production or freezing production, and it did boost oil prices, but is talk good enough? Well, in the past, it's been good enough to have knee-jerk reactions, but, you know, in reality, it's it's only been a matter of time before any one of them cheats on the production levels, and it, clearly uh, it, it would be out to 2017 before you would start to see any of those uh, reductions take place. So, you know, I think we've got to look at it that this, this is a, uh, news driven move off the bottom. We're, we're up roughly 10% off the, uh, the lows that we put in early in the month. That was around $43. We're up at 48 as we finish off the month. Had a good oversold reading from a technical perspective there at the, uh, at $43. And, uh, we're seven to nine, seven to eight months into this rally now. The norm uh, off of major lows would be 
more in the 8 to 12 month range. So you probably got a little bit of time left on the upside as far as the oil price is concerned on this run. Uh, and the uh, the oil stocks have been doing reasonably well here, uh, in particular the ones that have got the more leveraged balance sheets. Uh, they have been beaten down quite a bit. They've, they've come back uh, pretty dramatically. So uh, we would be looking at the uh, the $43 level as probably the critical spot to uh, be watching at this point. How's the Canadian dollar doing and how's it going to do? Well, uh, the Canadian bounced with the oil market, uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, but it's, it's underperforming. It's not showing the type of strength that you'd want to see as, uh, a petrol currency, which is clearly what we are when you overlay oil prices and Canadian dollars, uh, prices. They're, they're hard to tell them apart. So, uh, the dollar is still looking heavy from our perspective. Still looks as though it's vulnerable for a good, you know, a good at least three cents to the downside. Ross, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Well, you're very welcome, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Coming up, Doug Casey on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Doug Casey. He's the CEO of Casey Research, and he's also the author of a brand new book, Speculator. Can you tell us about Speculator? You know, I've written, I've written six nonfiction books, and two of them were on the New York Times bestseller list. One of them was number one for 19 weeks, and uh, I've never done a fiction book before. And uh, that's what this one, Speculator, is. Because there are some things that you can only say in fiction. There are some things that uh, are better said in the form of fiction than nonfiction. And that's what this book is about. And I think it's of particular interest to your listeners in the Vancouver area because it's, it centers around a... Um, about the around the mining exploration industry and around a stock mining fraud uh, that takes place in Africa. So um, it's kind of relevant at this point for a number of reasons. We're going into a new bull market in uh, gold, gold and gold mining stocks, and uh, that's what this book is about. It covers a lot of things, though. Can you tell us some of the highlights? And this isn't a short book. This is something that people can really get their teeth into. Well, I'm just sorry that the summer is over because it's a perfect beach book. But what it does, this is the first novel out of a series of six uh, that will reform the reputations of unjustly besmirched occupations. And, um, well, it takes our hero, Charles Knight, who at the age of 23... Uh, he's a high school dropout, but uh, a highly intelligent and very well-educated high, uh, high school dropout because, among other things, this book has uh, uh, a philosophy of education uh, in it. But uh, our 23-year-old Charles puts $10,000 into a mining exploration stock and gets lucky. And it, the stock goes 100 to 1, and his... 10,000 turns into a million. So at that point, he decides that it's time to check out with boots on the ground the prospect, which happens to be in the country of Gondwana in Africa. So he goes there, and that's where the adventure really starts. Um, he gets involved in a bush war. He turns his million dollars, which he already ran from 10,000, into 200 million. And uh, there's a lot of other stuff that happens in it. But I've got to say that um, 
the book is called Speculator because people are supposed to hate speculators, but Charles is a good guy. He's very ethical. He always does the right thing. And, of course, we can define how you determine what the right thing is because a lot of people have, uh, let's say, confused ideas on that subject. But uh, he makes his big money once he finds out it's a fraud because you can make bigger money and more certain money shorting a fraud than going long a good a good deal in, in other words even even the best uh deal there is where you've got the fantastic people and a good property and everything seems perfect the stock can go nowhere for various reasons but if you've got uh, a fraud that's been hyped and promoted and it's the top of the market uh, there's no way you can lose because it's going to zero. So uh, the book is about a theory of speculation, among other things, because that's uh, that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 30 or 40 years, and mostly in Vancouver. So this book, besides being just entertaining, can also educate people. Uh, precisely, yes. Uh, and here let me say something to... Uh, some of your listeners that may be in college or are contemplating going to college, I think it's a very, very bad idea at this point. Uh, if you go to college, you're going to spend maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars, you take on a lot of debt, and have your mind filled with all kinds of ridiculous politically correct ideas, because most people that go to college today uh, don't learn a hard science, uh, like engineering or something like that, or math. Uh, they basically go in for gender studies or English literature or history, and these are all things that you should and certainly can learn by yourself on your own time. You don't need to spend the time and money doing that. So what I advocate is if you want an education, you do what Charles does and uh, give yourself one in the, in the broad world. And uh, as a matter of fact, people wonder, what should I do with my life? Uh, how can I make money? How can I uh, get out of a dead-end job where I'm in a cubicle uh, for eight hours a day? And my suggestion is, is that you look where other people aren't looking. That's what a good speculator does. And at this point, I think Africa uh, has the um, most potential for the future. Uh, why? Because nobody goes there. I doubt if there's anybody listening now, but if they've been to Africa, it'll only have been to South Africa or maybe on a, a safari to Kenya, and that's it. Uh, I'm talking about the stranger places in Africa. And the reason I say that is that uh, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, uh, there's millions of people that have the same background, the same education, the same uh, thought processes, knowledge base, connections. Uh, so I hate to be in competition with millions of other people. Uh, I would rather go to a place like Africa where I'm unique and where I'm automatically several standard deviations uh, above any of the likely competition. Uh, so that's that's what people should be doing with their time and money, not going to college. And this is one of the sub-themes of the book. It's how Charles turns $10,000 into a gigantic fortune in a matter of months. When you said college is a bad idea, what about technical colleges like uh, MIT or the BC Institute of Technology? Ah, that's a different question uh, because there you probably need the discipline uh, of a formal environment like college. Uh, you probably need a, a lab to do work in. So if you're going to learn something like medicine, or engineering, or higher math, uh, or the sciences. That's what college is best used for. But all the soft things, which is what 90% of people that go to college take, total misallocation 
of both time and money. Uh, I did it myself. I wish I'd gotten this advice from somebody when I went off to college. And, um, but I want to give it to people now. Do you believe Speculator will be made into a movie? Uh, believe it or not, uh, one of my one of my friends is the founder of Lionsgate Films, and we've actually been talking about that. And as you know, Lionsgate is uh, it's a, one of the biggest movie producers these days, and uh, it was only founded ten years ago in Vancouver. Huge success. I mean, I lived in Vancouver for years. It's definitely my favorite city in North America. One of my favorite cities in the world. How close can a fiction book be to a non-fiction book without having to fact check? Well, all the facts in the book are checked because I've personally spent a lot of time in Africa. I've spent a lot of time my whole life in mining and the mining stock markets. Uh, my co-author uh, is an MD, and like a lot of MDs in the U.S., he doesn't want to be an MD anymore because... Uh, they have to spend uh, much more time filling out insurance forms and and uh, various government regulations than they do dealing with patients. So uh, the book is highly highly accurate in uh, in all ways. Uh, it's some some could say it's nonfiction disguised as fiction, but it's it's a it's a fun read and it's very well written. It won the Leonard Reed Award uh, this summer for the best libertarian fiction of the year. And uh, a number of people that have endorsed it, and it's got a couple pages of endorsements so far, a couple of people remarked that uh, uh, it's the best thing that's come out since Atlas Shrugged. Although I think it's more interesting than Atlas Shrugged. If you had a book in the High Ground series on this presidential election, what would the book be called? Oh, I think to answer the question that I think you're posing... Uh, Trump is going to win uh, in November in the U.S. And I don't support Trump. I just prefer him to Hillary. Let's put it that way. Uh, because uh, the good thing about uh, the Donald is that uh, he's going to break a lot of members of the establishment's rice bowls. He's going to overturn a lot of apple carts in Washington. And I'm confident of that because they hate him and he hates them. So uh, I think he's going to create chaos in Washington, which is just what's needed to fire a lot of these people. Uh, I don't know if he's uh, he doesn't he doesn't have the philosophical background to pull up some of these destructive three-letter agencies by their roots and throw them in the garbage where they des belong. But um, he's uh, much better than Hillary and. Uh, much less of a warmonger also, which is the big danger today, because right now, as we're speaking, we're on the cusp of the Greater Depression, which is what I call what we're going into now. Uh, this giant financial hurricane that started in 2007 was just the leading edge of a hurricane. Then for the last few years, we've been in the eye of this gigantic storm, as all these stupid governments all around the world have created trillions and trillions of new currency units. And right now, as we're speaking, we're going into the trailing edge of the storm. And it's going to be much worse, much different, you know, much longer lasting than uh, what we experienced in uh, 2008. So hold on to your hat. Is Trump part of the establishment? I mean, I can't see him hanging out with Bob the Butcher or Joe the, the Mechanic. Well, he's not a part of the regular establishment. And if you listen to anything on the media, the media is, with the exception of Fox, is 100% rabidly antagonistic to him. They hate him. Uh, all the uh, professors in universities and uh, so forth rabidly hate him. Uh, all the members of the, the government and NGOs, they all hate him. So that's the establishment I'm talking about. The fact that he's made a, a few billion dollars uh, means that he's been able to socialize with these people in the past. But, uh, no, they, they hate him and what he stands for now. So, no, I wouldn't say that he's a member of the establishment, not, 
not in the context that he's in now. I mean, they actively want to destroy him. You know, he's a rich guy, and he's gone to all these cocktail parties and given to these ridiculous charities that they all give to. I made him look like a member of the establishment in the past, but uh, no, I don't think that's the case. If the Clinton Foundation was out to save the world, how come we still have so many problems? They have billions. Yeah, well, the Clinton Foundation is really nothing but a gigantic slush fund. I mean, nobody knows uh, what they've spent money on. Uh, I think a lot of it has gone to subsidize uh, Bill and Hillary's friends and family and so forth, pay their expenses, and the money that's come into it uh, has basically been indirect bribery. So I hope that uh, this is a huge scandal, and I hope that uh, it's investigated and some people go to jail uh, because it's, uh, it, it's just totally improper, I think, what they've done. In fact, everything that the Clintons have done is totally improper. Uh, so uh, actually, I think the situation is serious enough that... Uh, after the election, no matter who wins, and I think if Hillary wins, it may be because she's stolen the election with rigging voting machines and uh, so forth. I wouldn't put anything past her. Um, I mean, we could be uh, on the edge of something that approaches the civil war in the U.S. I think it's, I think it's very serious because it's happening at exactly the time when the economy is going down big time, much worse than what happened in the 1930s, I think. Well, Bernie Sanders alleges that Hillary had has actually fixed the voting machine so that he couldn't win. Do you think that's the case? Yes, I think that's the case. I mean, uh, she rigged things against Bernie. I'm not a supporter of Bernie, but uh, I, I think that uh, the fact that Bernie got as much traction as he did among the Democrats and Trump came out of nowhere and overturned those, how many were there, 16 of those uh, non-entity dwarf Republicans that were running against him, it shows that the average American is very unhappy, very pissed off, both the left-wing and the right-wing Americans. That's what the, that's what the success of Bernie, uh, an obscure senator from, from Vermont, uh, and, and Trump, that's what, they, that's what they both mean. I mean, this is... This is a big deal, and it's going to be, um, like I said, it's going to be magnified by the collapse of the economy over the next couple of years, and probably the U.S. Has, has got troops in over 100 countries around the world, but at some point, they're probably going to start a real war, not just a sport war like in Iraq or Afghanistan, but a real war against big game. I mean, this is disastrous. This is very serious. Who would be the better president for junior mining stocks? Oh, no question that uh, Trump would be vastly better. I mean, just recently, uh, I went up to Alaska and I visited the Pebble Deposit, which is owned by Northern Dynasty. And um, if Hillary is elected, that, that's never going into, depo into, um, into production. And it's the largest undeveloped gold copper deposit in the world we've drilled out they've spent 700 million dollars drilling this out and so forth they've got a hundred million ounces of gold they've got billions of pounds of copper it'll never be developed under hillary if trump is elected uh that stock which is trading at i don't know what it is 90 cents or something like that now it, it's going to do an immediate 10 to 1 shot so um, if you're in the mining business, you better hope Trump wins and Hillary loses. The junior mining stocks are having a great year. Are you bullish on junior mining stocks going forward? Uh, I am because they're the, they're the only part of the market that is not uh, in a bubble. Uh, the bond market isn't just in a bubble. It's not even in a super bubble. It's in a hyper bubble. Uh, the bond market's a total disaster in the making. Uh, real estate, and here I'll put my finger on real estate in Vancouver, uh, is riding for a fall uh, for a lot of reasons, including low interest rates, 
which as interest rates go up, that's not going to help the uh, the local stock. That's not going to help the stock market. Uh, no, uh, gold, I think, is the best place to put your capital right now because it's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. And there are going to be defaults. Uh, the dollar is going to be losing value rapidly, both the Canadian and the U.S. dollar. So um, you've got to be in gold, and I think there's going to be, with all the trillions of dollars that are being created, uh, if just a teeny-weeny portion of it flows into these junior mining stocks, we're going to see a bull market like we haven't seen since the 70s for these things. So, um, yeah, I'm quite bullish on them, even though they've had an excellent year already. Uh, they're still uh, cheap in relative terms. Are you more bullish on gold or silver? Silver is, in good degree, an industrial metal, which, which I don't like. But on the other hand, it's a poor man's gold. It's got better supply-demand characteristics than gold does. Uh, uh, and it's more volatile because it's a much, much smaller market. So um, I like them both. I own them both. Uh, You've got to recognize that they're different metals. They're precious metals, but they're different. So um, own them both. But uh, gold is the safer and more secure thing to put your money in. Are you bullish or bearish on the U.S. dollar? It's going to reach its intrinsic value. And uh, what's its intrinsic value? It's just paper. It's an unsecured liability of a bankrupt government. And the U.S. government is printing these things up. Look, the, once, we're, once the, I'd say by this time next year, the U.S. government is going to be running a trillion-dollar deficit. That's on, that's on top of the 20 billion, 20 trillion that they owe that's official and another 100 trillion, uh, that they, that's, um, you know, uh, potential liabilities and off the book things and so forth, uh, insurance obligations. This is a disaster. No, the dollar is, you know, the dollar is just the, the best looking horse on its way to the slaughterhouse right now. Um, no, you want to own gold, not the not the dollar, quite frankly. Does the U.S. dollar have to be in a bear market to enable gold and silver to rise? Does it have to be? No, it doesn't have to be because um, you could have people that own a lot of worse currencies in the world that pile into the U.S. dollar in addition to piling into gold. So they could both go up together relative to other currencies. But I'm afraid that in Canada... I mean, you guys have it worse than we do in the U.S. because, uh, I mean, you've got a complete moron uh, running the country now. So, uh, well, that's true down here too. I mean, where where isn't uh, where where is there anybody in charge uh, of a country's government that's no, they're all bad. But I'd say Trudeau is one of the worst. Well, the latest figures show. Canadian government spending is up 5.7% with $63 billion spent in the first quarter alone. Yes, I know. I mean, you know, Trudeau is just a celebrity. That's that's all he is. I don't think he's very smart to start with. He certainly knows nothing about economics. So to the degree that he can run the country into the ground, he'll do that. But I don't know. What's the matter with the average Canadian voter that actually pulled the lever for this idiot? Well... I can say the same thing about the average American voter who voted for Obama, not once, but twice. So um, it, uh, it actually uh, destroys my confidence uh, in uh, the human race and the average guy. And there's a certain cynical uh, tilt to uh, the speculator that uh, evidences that, uh, that feeling that I have. There are predictions of gold hitting anywhere from two thousand to ten thousand dollars an ounce, and silver hitting perhaps a thousand dollars an ounce. Is that because physical gold and silver are becoming scarce? Well, they're not scarce. I mean, look, uh, there are about eighty million ounces of gold mined every year, and all the gold that's ever been mined is basically above ground and uh, available. There are about there are about 800 million, about 10 times as much, 
uh, ounces of silver that are mined every year, but uh, most of the silver that's been mined is used industrially. So they've got different characteristics, but we're not going to run out of either one. But put it this way, uh, all of the gold that's ever been mined in, in world history since day one is probably uh, about 6 billion ounces of gold above ground. There's 7 billion people in the world, so we have less than an ounce of gold for every person on the planet. And I personally own a lot more than my share, I can tell you that. So, um, no, I think gold is going higher. Does Deutsche Bank look like a possible catalyst to propel gold and silver higher? Yes, it is. <clears throat> Deutsche Bank is bankrupt. Uh, it's, it's a dead man walking, but that's true of almost all the banks in the world. They're all in the same position as Deutsche Bank is. They've been doing the same things. Um, whenever you have a fractional reserve banking system, and all the banks in the world are essentially on the fractional reserve system where they can lend many times the amount of money that's been deposited in them, it's a guaranteed disaster. Uh, and even worse than what's happening with Deutsche Bank is all the banks in Italy are acknowledged as being bankrupt. And we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars that uh, Italian depositors are going to lose unless the European Central Bank uh, creates the hundreds of trillions, of, hundreds of billions of dollars, or euros, I should say, to, uh, to bail out the Italian banking system. So which is it going to be? Are they going to destroy the euro? Or, or are they going to uh, uh, let the Italian banking system fail, which is going to have other consequences? I don't know. They're between Scylla and Charybdis. They're between a rock and a hard place. I mean, there's no way out at this point. I don't see what it is. I mean, these idiots have, have printed trillions of currency units. They've taken interest rates, not just to zero, but to negative numbers, which I thought was metaphysically impossible. Now they're trying to get rid of currency so that you won't have dollars in your pocket. You're going to have to use uh, a credit card or your iPhone. You're going to have to use digital money, which gives... Uh, the so-called elite complete power. Uh, it'll kill the black market. It'll kill your ability to buy anything uh, using cash because you won't be able to have enough cash. And this is very serious consequences for personal freedom in addition to the economy. There are debt bubbles around the world, personal, corporate, and government debt. By printing money, can the central banks keep those debt bubbles afloat? I think we're pretty close to the end game at this point. Um, they're going to destroy the currency in both the U.S. and Canada and other countries. The same thing that's going to happen up here that's happened many times in the past in Argentina and Brazil and most of the countries in Latin America. They're going to wipe out the currency. It sounds unbelievable, but, uh, you know, if we look at it from a long-term point of view, since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, the U.S. dollar has lost about 98% of its value. Uh, that last 2% is going to go very quickly at this point. No, it's uh, very serious. It's very serious because it's, it's going to discourage people from saving. And the way you get wealthy is by producing more than you consume and saving the difference. That creates capital. But... Everybody saves in dollars, basically. And if you destroy the dollar, you're going to destroy the savings. And who does savings? The middle class. So the middle class is just going to be hammered in the years to come. You're going to have to learn to be a speculator, as all these markets are going to be going up and down like a, an elevator with a lunatic at the controls. So this is another reason why I wrote that book, uh, Speculator, and why I think people should get it and read it now. I mean, it's entertaining, sure, but uh, I mean, I think it's got a lot of the keys to uh, keeping your head above water in the next few years. How long can the bond market bubble and low interest rates continue? Uh, that's a good question. Um, my God, 
Is there a limit to stupidity? I mean, Einstein said that uh, after hydrogen, stupidity was the most common thing in the universe. So uh, how long are they going to try to keep interest rates as low as they are? Because with interest rates as low as they are, it's destroying the world banking system. It's destroying the world insurance system. Uh, it's destroying the capital of savers. Um, the only the only thing that uh, low interest rates are good for, they're doing it because they want people to borrow more and create inflation, which is unbelievable itself that they actually want to create inflation. Uh, but um, hmm. no, I mean we're in un- we're in uncharted territory, and when this thing starts unraveling, which it's doing right now. Uh, it's hard to say where it's all going to end, but uh, there's going to be millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of very unhappy people in North America and around the world. Uh, let me say billions of unhappy people. Are currency restrictions around the world, especially in China, being tightened? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all of these governments are going to try to keep capital from leaving uh, the Chinese are not happy about uh, seeing uh, so many of their citizens come to uh, Canada, Vancouver in particular, and uh, buy properties. Most of it was uh, stolen money, I think. A lot of it was stolen money. So they're going to tighten that up. That's going to hurt the Vancouver real estate market even more than this 15% taxes uh, uh, is doing. Uh, but all over the world, it's harder and harder to get money out of your country. As an American, it's, there's no official law against it, but it's almost impossible for an American to open up a foreign bank or brokerage account. Almost impossible now because of the, the new rules that they passed. So it's not against the law, it's just that nobody will take your money. So this is going to happen increasingly all over the world. So I suggest that your listeners diversify politically while it's still possible and it's easier for canadians than for americans much easier this year china's middle class is now larger than the u.s middle class are you bullish or bearish on china going forward oh yeah i think china's going to take over the world basically uh, for a lot of reasons um you know there have been studies done that show that the the average East Asian has got an IQ, if, if the average European has got an IQ of 100, the average East Asian has got an IQ of about 105. Uh, so that's going in their favor. They've had such hard times for so long that they still have much more of a work ethic than we do. Uh, they're, they love saving. I mean, they save a lot more than North Americans or Europeans do. So they've got the capital to do things. Um, and, you know, their government, unlike the U.S. government, isn't pissing away most of its tax revenue on welfare. They don't have welfare there to speak of. And uh, their military, even though it's growing, is they're, they're spending vastly less, like 10% on their military, what the U.S. does. Uh, so they've got capital to put into productive things. So, sure. Uh, I'll bet on China in the future, although I've got to tell you that if I wanted to make money now, I would go to Africa, and I do go to Africa, and that's one of the, that's one of the themes in, in Speculator. It's that our hero goes to Africa because if you want to make money quickly, Africa is the place you go. You don't go to China. You don't go to Europe. Uh, you, you go to you go to Africa because you've got advantages that you don't have in those other places as you know as, 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 as a typical North American. Is India the new China? No, I think that India's got all kinds of problems. Um, you know, just it, it's got it, it's got cultural problems. That it's going to take it a long time to overcome. So. Um, uh, I, I can't wrap my head around India. You know, it's got it's got some real bright spots. It's got a lot of bright people there, but I think the culture is militating against it in, in a lot of ways. So, um, 
But you know, that's a whole continent, not just a country. Uh, well, of course, that's true of that's true of China too. But um, I think that China is going to have a much better future than than India uh, it does. Just the feeling because of the the culture. Are you bullish on Britain or the European Union? I'm so glad that Britain uh, exited from the EU, which serves no useful purpose. I mean, the fact that it's free trade and free travel, that's wonderful. But you don't need treaties to have free trade and free travel. All you have to do is get rid of duties and quotas in your own country. But these stupid governments put their countries under embargo, in effect with uh, quotas and, and, uh, and duties. So uh, the fact that uh, Britain exited means that they've gotten rid of a whole layer of bureaucrats, a whole layer of regulation. I mean, people aren't aware that there are 50,000 bureaucrats living in Brussels that making life miserable for everybody with their regulations and, and, and so forth. So Britain's very intelligent having left that all behind. And you don't need the uh, European Union. Switzerland has proved that. It's the most prosperous country in Europe. It's not a member of the EU. So uh, uh, a major reason that Britain left is it wants to get away from all the migration that's happening, too. This is uh, another thing. This is the biggest thing since the fall of the Roman Empire, the, the waves of migrants that are going to be uh, coming in from the Middle East, from Central Asia, from Africa south of the Sahara from uh, maybe from maybe from India uh, in the future I mean this is very serious I mean a few a few immigrants wonderful nice thing helpful to everybody opportunity seekers very good but when you have masses of migrants that want to come in for to take advantage of the welfare system this is a disaster culturally with protectionism rising around the world, are investment opportunities being created? Hmm. No. Uh, protectionism destroys investment opportunities. So protectionism offers a, offers a chance for successful short sales, but it uh, precludes uh, investment opportunities. It's pretty obvious with this election, the American population is becoming more polarized. Could this lead to civil unrest? Yeah, of course it will. I mean, we're looking at the possibility of something that looks like a, a civil war in the U.S. I mean, the uh, people that support Trump and the people that support Hillary are like at total odds with each other, philosophically, politically, socially. I mean, this is, uh, I've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, it was somewhat like this in the 60s uh, with Nixon and all that when there were really serious riots and bombings and, and they had to line up buses bumper to bumper around the White House to keep the rioters away. Uh, I think this is going to be at least as serious as the 60s, though. Are there markets that could benefit from that unrest? Gold is going to benefit. Gold is the only thing that's going to benefit because people are going to be scared. Would you say the U.S. is now a fascist country? Yeah, definitely. Sure. It's, uh, fascism is where the corporations are hooked up with the government, and they work together, hand in glove. That's what Mussolini's fascism was all about. So, absolutely. I mean, it's not, America is not a capitalist country. Uh, I mean, what we have here isn't capitalism. It's crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is fascism. Does the police state include market regulators, and will the police state continue to grow? Yes, it will. It'll keep growing. It'll keep growing until it collapses. And uh, this is one of the good things about the Greater Depression: is perhaps when the government's totally bankrupt, it will collapse. So, but it, unfortunately, after after you have a collapse of something like that, things usually get worse, not better, like they like they did in France after the 1789 revolution or in Russia after the 1917 revolution. I mean, I would have been all for those things, except then it got worse. So uh, serious upsets uh, are usually not good for the freedom of the average person. Do you think the U.S. Bill of Rights and Constitution have effectively already been suspended? Yes, the, the, Const the U.S. Constitution 
and the Bill of Rights are dead letters. They've been interpreted out of existence. So people refer to them, but the court cases and the, the actual implementation of them, they're now meaningless at this point. So uh, it's amazing. I mean, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, uh, we gave Iraq a constitution, a horrible constitution. We should have, well, they should have, if they wanted a decent constitution, and it's got problems, but the U.S. Constitution is, is the best national constitution out there, we might as well have given them ours because we don't use it. It's been totally interpreted out of existence. It's a dead letter. Forget about the U.S. Constitution. Doug, just before we go, can you please tell us where people can get your new book, Speculator? Well, I urge people to get it. You will find it's an excellent read. They're going to be very glad that they read it. Uh, but Amazon is probably the best place to get it, or Barnes & Noble, because there aren't any bookstores left anymore. They're all, they all seem to be gone. Uh, and uh, with so many books published every year, even if you find a big bookstore, so few books that are published are even able, they're able to stock. So go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or go to highgroundnovels.com, which is our website, and uh, you can order it there. Any of these are good alternatives. Doug, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Oh, my pleasure. My guest has been Doug Casey, CEO and founder of Casey Research, and also the author of the brand new book, Speculator. Coming up, we get a report from the Toronto Minds and Money show from John Kaiser next on This Week in Money. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Our guest is John Kaiser, the head of Kaiser Research. Today he's putting on his reporter's hat for us to tell us what happened at the Toronto Mines and Money Show. John, what was the mood there? Well, the mood was a lot of industry people who uh, are, are very actively uh, positioning themselves, uh, getting projects into their companies, uh, eager to explain. We had CEOs sitting in the booths, uh, taking time with people like myself to explain what their story is, where they're going, why they think they're going to succeed. We, we, we have been in a bit of a market lull since uh, mid-August after a tremendous run from uh, the end of January that, that violated the PDAC curse, that avoided the summer doldrums. But the mood generally is that... Uh, Yes, we're having a bit of a year-end type of slump, which normally happens, but everybody's gearing up for things to continue strongly in 2017. There's optimism for better, higher-trending metal prices, not spectacular metal price gains, but there's also an awful lot of interest in discovery exploration. Was there any one area of exploration they were interested in? Well, uh, if one looks at the different uh, presentations, uh, I hosted the uh, afternoon panel of uh, South America on on Tuesday, and uh, the the Minister of Mines from Ecuador, um, Javier Cordova, he did a presentation, and he was at the Mines and Money London show uh, in, in November last year, where they they introduced this new tax deal, they are tax regime they are bringing in that enables Lundin Gold to put the Fruta del Norte discovery back on track. And what he was explaining to the audience today is that they now have the concession granting system operational again. There's about 300 applications that have already been submitted that will uh, be uh, be approved and awarded over the next few months. So Ecuador, which started off as a huge sort of regional play in the wake of. Um, the uh, Futa del Norte discovery by Aurelian, which took the stock from sixty cents to forty dollars back in two thousand and six, uh, uh, and then got interrupted when they introduced these brutal windfall tax, and then even froze concessions. That country is back in action, 
And the another panel that uh, I moderated in Brazil too, there, there's been a lot of unhappiness with the slow permitting process, but with the uh, uh, impeachment of Dilma Rousseff uh, uh, and this uh, anti-corruption campaign that's going on, there's also a feeling that Brazil, which has also been relatively underexplored, is going to come out of its sort of permitting uh, rut where nothing seems to be happening, and is also another great destination for capital to start going to. Is this proof that trying to tax the golden goose to death is really the wrong way to go? Indeed, and in fact, that's what killed Ecuador, and they realized everybody vacated the space. Kinross, after spending a billion dollars, uh, uh, decided it wasn't going to proceed with anything. Uh, in Brazil, they're working on a new mining code, and they, they, they started it in 2009, and uh, wanted to introduce heavy-duty royalties and all that as a big sort of capital grab, but iron prices have since fallen back to sort of, Fifty, fifty, sixty dollars from the hundred and forty, fifty dollar highs. So, so there is there is a a, a a a realism creeping back in. They're saying, okay, we cannot slay what we think are these golden geese uh, because these markets are cyclical, and if we uh, impose these huge brutal tax regimes, everybody the capital goes away. It simply goes elsewhere. A realization that the jobs are more important than the taxes. Well. Yes, when when you consider that a project will churn three hundred, four hundred, five hundred million dollars of revenue, and that profit margins are probably just a ten, ten, fifteen percent, you got to think all that cost side is being utilized by 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 the, by the mining facilities, by all the procurers, by all the delivery systems, and all all that stimulates the economy, whether or not the company makes any money. And you're not going to get these big projects built if you do not allow the company to make a decent profit on the uh, operation. Was there any one speaker who really stood out at the Mines and Money Show in Toronto? Well, Robert Friedland uh, spoke for over an hour and uh, pretty much held the, held the audience's attention. His big theme these days is forget about gold. He's, he's pretty negative on gold because he says it's a useless metal. You dig it out of the ground, you stick it in a vault somewhere, and it does nothing. And, of course, Robert Friedland always talks his book. His assets are in Ivanhoe Mines, which has pro- platinum project in in uh, South Africa and copper and zinc projects uh, in in the Congo. And on this Kamoa project, he was talking about a, a brand-new discovery that even eclipses Kamoa, which was a fantastic copper discovery. It's the Kukula deposit, and it's a 7 to 9% uh, copper system that's that's thick and flat and they haven't found the limits to it but he was arguing that we should be focusing on metals that are part of the future and it was refreshing to hear somebody talk about the uh we got to think about what's there what we are creating for our grandchildren for for our children uh, uh gold exploration doesn't really do anything that has a a negative uh attitude towards the future we need we need nickel and cobalt to support the electric car industry the battery systems that are in there he even talked about his company in australia clean tech scandium where he has a uh, the richest uh, scandium deposit in the world for which he has recently delivered a positive feasibility study so and even nickel which is in the doghouse he's saying nickel is a key part of the battery the electric car future you need to look at these base metals go after them and of course he really hammered the idea of pollution one of his more memorable lines is that the combination of pollution and corruption is toxic to the future of the the china's communist party and they're already cracking down on the corruption and the pollution is coming next and that has implications for the supply of a lot of metals that are come dominantly out out of china but it also has implications for changing technologies uh, and the way they utilize metals so that they have a lower uh, uh, environmental impact well john you also had a bit of a speech for the people there Yes, uh, I, I, I also chaired the, uh, the, the uh, innovation, the, the financing innovation uh, uh, session, and my own talk was uh, going into greater detail about this crowd-based outcome visualization concept that, uh, that I am involved with. I've been talking about it for several years, waiting for somebody else to do it. Uh, nobody really has. So I've been uh, backed by uh, Andy Gregg, uh, the uh, former head of Bechtel's Global Mining Unit, 
to build this thing. I was in Australia a couple of weeks uh, for a couple of weeks in uh, in August uh, with the IT team developing this. We hope to have this ready for beta testing in December. It in essence allows an anonymous member of the public to listen to the promoter's story, figure it out what the deposit would look like, and hook up an imaginary mind to it, and then put all these numbers into a form, and then the system calculates, well, what's the net present value, what's the internal rate of return, and then share it in a public space for others to criticize or emulate. And this will be a huge uh, counter for this problem right now where the public doesn't know, well, if whatever it is that you're talking about becomes reality, how much money would I make? This will solve this huge problem that's hurting the juniors, especially the juniors engaged in earlier stage exploration. And my website, the conference uh, speech section, has the presentation there for anybody who wants to uh, uh, find out more about it. John, thanks for speaking with us. Jim, it was great. Thank you. My guest has been John Kaiser, CEO of Kaiser Research. He was reporting to us from the Toronto Minds and Money Show. Coming up, Peyton Nyquist, next on This Week in Money. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. I'm speaking with Peyton Nyquist, investment advisor at MackeyResearch.com. Peyton, what happened on the Canadian junior markets this past week? Uh, the TSX was had a high of 14,820. A low was around 14,518. Uh, closing out for the week at uh 14,725. The uh, TSX Venture had a high of about 812. Low was around uh, 794, closing at 800 flat for the week, so up about 12 points, or uh, sorry, down about 12 points. And the CSE high was 730, low was 708, closing at uh, 729, and uh, was up about 14 points for the week. Has the shine gone off the Canadian junior miners, especially for gold? You know, I'm probably sounding a bit like a broken record on the show, but the the gold stuff continues to be really busy. Uh, K92, a bunch of the um, even more junior gold exploration and, and uh, soon-to production companies, all very, very busy this week. So the, there's still a lot of life there. Was there any one sector that really stood out for the week? You, you know, it's it primarily is is the overall resource sector. There, it was kind of across the board here, uh, whether it's uranium, diamonds, uh, you know, gold still primarily at the forefront. And uh, I know we talked a little bit about the marijuana sector, but that continues to be quite busy as well. Are people scared to get into the marijuana business? I noticed the Royal Bank and one other Canadian bank said they're not going to set out loans in the pot industry. Well, you know, that's kind of been, that's kind of been, I think, the big concern here. You know, even down in the U.S., it's been very difficult for the marijuana companies, even in states where it's legal, to open up bank accounts and they've had to operate on a cash basis. So that's been kind of where the roadblock has been for that. But, I, you know, as you see that industry continue to build, you know, I'm sure they'll get to a point where it's too big to deny at some point. Well, I know the American alcohol business has now has a, a lobby group that's fighting the legalization of pot because they think it'll go into their sales. Perhaps they should diversify into nacho chips. Well, you know, it's funny, even a couple of years ago when they privatized a bunch of provinces in Canada in the liquor business, uh, that's kind of been the assumption as to where the marijuana business in Canada could go is is the liquor board taking control of it and and maybe selling uh marijuana products uh, assuming this goes to a to a fully recreational 
uh, situation, they'd be selling marijuana products out of the liquor stores. Yes, but the liquor store doesn't make booze itself. No, well, and exactly. So the, I think where the government obviously would make money would be on producing uh, marijuana for the liquor stores and as well as the tax benefits, obviously. What about uranium? I hear China is looking at building a number of new reactors simply because their air pollution is so bad. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about China as well as Japan turning on some more reactors. I had somebody tell me the other day that China turn, is planning on turning on a, a couple of reactors a month here for the for the foreseeable future. So, I I think the demand is is going to get there, and and you're starting to see a lot of these uh, uranium companies start to trend up, and uh, I think I think from here on out there should be quite a lot of attention there. Getting into the precious substances, not gold, but diamonds this time. Again, new diamond plays coming onto line. Yeah, you know, there's been there's been a lot of uh, new diamond plays come on. You've seen uh, CVV, uh, Can Alaska, which was drilling for diamonds up in Saskatchewan. They had a, a, a joint venture uh, with the Beers. You're also seeing a company called Margaret Lake Diamonds actually this week started to gain a lot of attention uh, when they announced that they were they're raising some money, I believe, to go and drill uh, their targets that they've got up near Mountain Province's new uh, diamond mine that came into production last week. So you're starting to see quite a lot of attention go up into that area now. Diamonds, of course, didn't used to be Canadian. Now I understand they laser little polar bears on the diamonds to identify them as Canadian, and they're so precious there's now counterfeits. Yeah, you know, the Canadian diamonds that they found up north uh, in the Northwest Territories all are very high-quality, um, gem-quality diamonds. So there's a lot of, there, there's a big demand for that. Obviously, there's people who are a bit concerned about whether conflict diamonds come out of Africa or not. You know, Canada's kind of been a clean slate in that regard. Um and, and you're seeing it from from what I hear in Mountain Province, the the diamonds that they've been pulling out of there are all very high gem quality diamonds. So uh, the Canadian diamond space seems to be very strong between between Mountain Province going into production as well as Stornoway coming into production here as well. There's uh, there should be a lot of attention there. Peyton, thanks a lot for chatting with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Peyton Nyquist, investment advisor at MackeyResearch.com. That wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Doug Casey, John Kaiser, and Peyton Nyquist, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can email us at info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. Now stand by for Company Showcase with Lee Barker. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're chatting with Lee Barker. He's the Chief Technical Advisor for GEM International Resources Incorporated. It trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. His website is GEMDiamondMining.com. Lee, can you tell us a bit more about GEM International? Well, certainly, uh GEM International is a company that was uh, revived from a shell uh, earlier this year, and it has uh, has had the opportunity to acquire a very large diamond exploration property in Angola, northeastern Angola. Uh, northeastern Angola produces about 25% of the world's high-quality diamonds. Uh, the fourth largest bedrock diamond mine in the world is located there, and the GEM project is is part and parcel of a 3,000 square kilometer license that GEM acquired from its partners uh, earlier this year. The license is a little bit unique in a number of ways. Number one, it's very, very large. Uh, historically, very small licenses only were granted in Angola. Uh, I worked in Angola from 1996 until 2003, so I know the country well. 
Uh, this large license, uh, as a result of, of course, uh, we had a bit of a, a meltdown in commodities and oil in the last seven or eight years. And Angola bases its cash flow and its foreign exchange mostly on oil and diamonds. And uh, with the oil business going down, they were looking for ways to attract more investment in the commodity side and the resource side and, of course, on the diamond side as well. And so they large, large now large uh, licenses are available for uh, for acquisition by uh, foreign investors, and uh, the other one of the other unique things about this license is that it's located about 20 kilometers south of the fourth largest diamond mine in the world. The area has historically had a, a significant amount of diamond production, bo both from this one diamond mine, but also from alluvial mining uh, in the rivers that uh, travel through this part of the world. Uh, alluvial diamond mining in northeastern Angola has been going on for probably almost 75 years now, early 1950s. Diamonds have been known there and produced there for a long, long time. And uh, the area that uh, that uh, Jim has acquired is called the Dalla License. And interestingly, this license was previously explored for bedrock-type diamond deposits in Kimberlite pipes for about four or five years between 2004 and 2009 uh, by a Irish-based company that spent over $15 million and generated a very, very large amount of very good data. Of course, in 2008, we had the world economic meltdown. And these guys couldn't raise any more money for their work, and uh, they dropped the license, and it was subsequently reacquired by the partners that Jim has, who are very experienced, uh, actually alluvial miners from South Africa that I worked with for seven years in Angola myself. And um, the, the other opportunity, of course, apart from the alluvial mining, which can give early cash flow, and, and uh, they're gearing up for that as we speak, is uh, these bedrock diamond deposits, which are hosted in rocks called kimberlites, or kimberlite pipes. And the uh, Akatoka mine, the uh, fourth largest mine in the world, is a very large kimberlite pipe. It has over two, had over 250,000 ounces of, or, uh, sorry, carats of uh, reserves of diamond when it opened in 1998. It uh, still has about 170 to 180,000, a million carats uh, still remaining in the uh, reserve base. Uh, Katoka has been extremely successful. Uh, they recently announced exploration work had generated another large, large diamond deposit nearby. And um, on the Dalla license, which Jim has acquired an interest in and is it will be exploring, there were six new Kimberlite pipes located by the previous guys uh, from the Irish company. Uh, they were never followed up as to their diamond content. Uh, very, very small drill holes were drilled in them. And it was uh, they were discovered as a result of an airborne magnetic survey. And uh, this survey, <clears throat> this method of surveying is only now just be becoming used more in Angola. Historically, it had all been physical prospecting on the ground. and of course, mining the gravels and things in these rivers, but the source of the diamonds in all these gravels are these kimberlite pipes, which are eroded and weathered, and the diamonds are carried by the rivers and deposited in gravels associated with the river, uh, old river bases. The, the interesting thing is that the rivers in this area flow north. Uh, ultimately, they go into the Congo River and go out to the Atlantic Ocean. In this particular area, the Katoka Mine, which is the largest known source of diamonds, is north of the Dalla license. So there uh, has to be diamonds in some of these kimberlites to have produced the alluvial, alluvial diamonds that are currently being mined at Dalla in the, in the, uh, in the Dalla license itself. And uh, at the moment, uh, GEM has started uh, physical activity on the ground. Uh, they've cleared out all the uh, illegal miners. They're in the process of setting up a base and acquiring some equipment, some mining equipment and processing equipment. And uh, at, at, at the moment, uh, I think we have a reasonable opportunity here for both early stage cash flow from the alluvial mining of the gravels and things, and in the future, the, the, the big possibility of finding a, a diamondiferous kimberlite pipe. There's well over 30 targets on the Dalla license that have not yet been tested. As I said, the uh, earlier exploration company ran out of money and was uh, unable to raise more funds. And uh, in that way, the, the project is somewhat unique because for a relatively small investment, they can get cash flow. They want to use the cash flow to actually do the exploration work for the uh, the bedrock kimberlite uh, diamond deposits. And uh, they've raised about a million and a half dollars so far and are in the process of raising about $3 million more 
and that will carry them through certainly to uh, cash flow and uh, the beginning of the exploration for the uh, for the Kimberlites and evaluation of the ones that have already been found. Now, I know Angola was the site of a very vicious civil war. What's it like right now? The war basically was over when the rebel leader, Julius uh, Jonas Savembe, was, uh, was killed in 2002. And since that time, the infrastructure of the country has been completely rebuilt uh, to a large extent by the Chinese because uh, they love the oil and all the other resources that uh, Angola has that can be developed. There are paved roads, painted buildings, new hotels, new subdivisions, and uh, the country has been restored, not to what it was, of course, in colonial times when the Portuguese ran it, but back to a, a normal situation. The, the issues of uh, security that were related to the old civil war are completely gone now, and uh, people are getting on with their lives and trying to build new businesses and, uh, and make things work. What kind of improvements have the government made to make it a seamless process if you're a miner there? Well, the, the system is actually relatively uh, <clears throat> relatively progressive to do things. Uh, you begin with an exploration license uh, or a mining license, as uh, Della, Della right now has a mining license for alluvials. And uh, they can mine alluvials anywhere in this 3,000 square kilometer area. Uh, on the Kimberlite side, when you identify a Kimberlite pipe and do enough work to prove that it uh, can be commercial, uh, you basically pr- provide a study uh, with all the normal environmental things and everything to the government, and then you would apply for a mining license on that particular deposit, which would be inside the overall larger Dalla 3,000 square kilometer license. And you, nobody else can come into that license and uh, go around you to uh, acquire other timber lights. Uh, you're your uh, have preferential rights on all of that, but the actual mining license area for a bedrock deposit would be uh, a little bit more restricted, and of course you have to do all your environmental and physical studies and mine planning and things like that uh, as part and parcel of the application. But it's quite straightforward, and uh, uh, you know the regulations are adherence to uh, United Nations environmental uh, uh, policies that relate to uh, resource development and mining, and it's... Uh, it's not difficult, uh, you know, the difficult thing is getting the job done, and getting the job done is much easier now because the infrastructure is back in place, the roads are open, the bridges are up, the roads are paved, and you have availability of staff and equipment and everything locally now. How do Angolan diamonds stack up when it comes to quality? Uh, very high quality because uh, in, the, in the world right now, as I said at the beginning, about 25%, even possibly more, uh, of uh, how the world's highest quality gem type of diamonds come from Angola. And they're prized, and there's a lot of large stones in Angola that, of course, command high prices. Um, uh, we, we know that the, uh, the diamond market these days is uh, a little bit soft, but the, the, the market for the high quality, very clean, white, large stones has maintained uh, uh, maintained a strong position all throughout all the, uh, the economic crisis. And... Uh, as things improve, of course, in the world economy and uh, people have more discretionary revenue to spend, uh, the, the overall business will uh, get back to what it used to be. But uh, not a big uh, not a big problem. Golden diamonds are very highly sought after uh, by cutters uh, to turn into jewelry. What kind of labor relations do you have in Angola? You know, because the, the legacy of, of hard rock mining in Angola is relatively small and relatively sh- relatively uh, new in comparison to South Africa. Uh, most of the mines are surface mines, so you don't have the issues of these deep underground mines with very difficult working conditions that uh, the South Africans have been operating for probably close to 100, over 100 years now. And uh, in Angola, basically, uh, people want, you know, obviously want jobs. Uh, there is skilled labor available. There's some technical schools that are actually generating relatively good technical People, mining engineers and technicians, surveyors, things like that. And uh, my experience there was uh, there were good people available and, and uh, they were willing to work and they were hard workers and we had a very good relationship with them. There was no issues about strikes or anything like that. You know, everybody was paid relatively well and, and they were quite uh, quite competent. Lee, what makes GEM International stand out from other resource companies? The, the difference for GEM is that they have the ability with a relatively modest investment to start getting cash flow from producing diamonds from these alluvial deposits. Um, I could show you videos from this from the 
the, the Dalla property of dozens of areas where uh, the uh, artisanal miners are mining and have been mining diamonds in the past. And we know the diamonds are there. They don't spend hundreds of uh, man hours of work physically with shovels and wheelbarrows moving gravel and stuff if there isn't anything in it for them to uh, get some benefit out of. So that's that's key. As I said, uh, the operators uh, who are very experienced people have uh, moved most of these people away now, and uh, they're setting up to, uh, to to mine these gravels themselves and uh, at relatively low cost. You know, we'll probably be in production with an expenditure of under a million and a half dollars. And then, of course, the Kimberlite exploration is a little bit slower. It requires uh, core drilling or perhaps uh, large diameter drilling in, in the future. But uh, the ability of GEM to actually start getting revenue uh, far more uh, advanced in the exploration cycle of its uh, of its uh, development of this property is is quite unique. You know, people that are working in Canada in the diamond exploration field, things like that, they don't have these opportunities because we don't have these kinds of deposits in Canada or you know almost anywhere else. The alluvial deposits are are quite rich uh, locally, and they're the the bread and butter and. Uh, if you follow a company called Lucapa Diamonds, which is uh, Australian-based, they also have an alluvial diamond property to the uh, southwest of Dalla. <clears throat> it's on a different river system, but they're producing some very large diamonds up to 400 carats in size uh, from that the, the alluvial mining there. They haven't started any kimberlite exploration yet for the bedrock deposits. And uh, they I think they had $4.5 million revenue in the first quarter of this year. And... Um, there's no reason why, you know, with the scale of the operation uh, building up, that uh, that Gem can't have uh, some cash flow very, very quickly. We're hoping to have uh, revenue by the end of the year. Lee, how can people find out more about Gem International? Uh, the company has a good website. Uh, they can go to uh, gemdiamondmining.com. There's a full presentation on the website that gives more details about the project, the area, shows where it is in relation to. Uh, different uh, other projects, and it also talks a little bit about Angola as a country and uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, repatriation, the re, re, re in, new infrastructure, and all the uh, improvements that have happened since the Civil War ended. Lee, thank you very much for chatting with us. Well, you're very welcome. I look forward to a follow-up. We've been talking with Lee Barker. He's the Chief Technical Advisor for GEM International Resources Incorporated. They trade on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol GI. Their website, gemdiamondmining.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.